phone. Standish is excused, and we will call the meeting to order, 8 o'clock. So with that, uh, Peter, you do the roll call. Sure. Uh, Rickard? Here. Epstein? Here. Smith? Here. Dornbrook here, and O'Grady absent. Okay. We'll move on to announcements. Uh, Eric? Wood? Yeah, I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, Kirkwood Meadows Public Utility District regular board meeting. The district would like uh, to welcome uh, our Alpine County Supervisor. It's nice for her to come over without no accident this time, so it's nice <laughs> to see you. We're not stuck. Um, this meeting is being fed live over the Internet, and the public can view it by going to kmpud.com and following the appropriate link. If you'd like to ask any questions, please send an email to E. Christison, that's Christ E. Son, at kmpud.com, and the board will take them as they arrive. Good. Uh, we'll move on to comments. Jeff, Jeff can I, Jeff, can yes. I uh, add one thing? Um, and that is I just want to um, say that the reason the closed session is early on the agenda, it was at my request. I, I need to catch a plane um, to help with a family matter, uh, and so I needed to have that early in the agenda. I apologize for any inconvenience that will create for anybody, you know, hanging out until the regular session begins. Thank you for that, Eric. We understand. Um, so moving on to comments from the audience. Any comments from our staff members here? Ter <laughs> Terry, any comments? Um, with no comments, we'll move on to corrections to the agenda or consent calendar. Anybody wish to make any uh, changes? We with that, uh, we'll approve the regular board meeting minutes. I move to approve the uh, board meet, the uh, meeting minutes for, as, for, as for January 13th. I'm sorry. For Should January 13th, yes. I second that. Um, we have to do the voice vote. Um, Eric? Uh, yeah, uh, aye. Epstein, aye. Smith, aye. Thornburg, aye. Okay, then we'll move on to B, approve the current consent claims. I move we approve the consent claims. I'll second that. We'll move to uh, um, approve that then. Epstein, uh, aye. Dornbrook, aye. Smith, aye. Uh, Eric, aye. And number C, review the receivable shutoffs report. I have a motion to approve that. So moved. I second. Uh, all in favor? Epstein, aye. Dornbrook, aye. Smith, aye. Smith, aye. Okay, then we'll move on to the closed session. And uh, <coughs> yeah, we'll, we'll adjourn to the other room. Um, you can enjoy your coffees. And we shouldn't be too long, but uh, we will see. We should really have snacks for our... Yes, yeah. and we, we, we'll call Eric from the landline. Yes, in I have his cell okay. phone. Just got that. Okay, so. good. Uh, actually, actually, my landline, which I just gave to Jeff, would be better. Okay, we'll do that. Thank you, Eric. In session or open meeting, back in session, and uh, report um, our closed session uh, about our exposure to litigation involving a potential case concerning PUD and PG&E interconnection agreement. And uh, in our session, closed session, the board directed the ad hoc committee and the general manager to review and pursue Russ and COP funding to fund one-time lump sum O&M payment to PG&E versus a monthly O&M payment in perpetuity per the interconnection agreement with PG&E. Further, the board directed the ad hoc committee and general manager to analyze the one-time payment versus monthly payment to determine the benefits to district customers. So that was our action for zero. Uh, Standish uh, absent. So with that, we will move on to item nine, items for board action and finances. Morning. Welcome, Kelly. So we will begin with the... Uh, balance sheet on page 18 of your packet. Um, 
The only thing really to note on the balance sheet uh, what for um, December was uh, we are we were 1.2 uh, million up from plan in total operating and 1 million uh, dollars was transferred from operating uh, to the operating reserve in January as uh, uh, noted in our cash flow so um, really nothing else to report uh, on the balance sheet unless there are any questions okay uh, moving on to the combined income statement um, uh, you'll note uh, there were uh, an, there was an overage in other revenues for uh, December and uh, this is mainly due to the proceeds from our uh, auction of our renewable energy credits um, at 46,000 I, Bob's going to tell me that's not what they're called. That's right. <laughs> if you read the minutes. <laughs> the auction, greenhouse gas auction. Thank you. <laughs> that's, it's, it's what we have them listed in our, in our books as renewable energy credits, so I'm it's sorry. Okay. It's, our, it's our, our annual little feud. Yes. <laughs> um, operating revenues, though, for uh, December were um, right at... Uh, budget due to this, uh, due to the proceeds from that, um, but year to date we are up uh, by $103,000. Year to date total operating is up from plan by $213,000 and uh, year to date uh, net loss uh, is up from plan by $466,000 and this also has to do uh, uh, with the fact that we've gotten uh, funds from FEMA and Cal OES. Uh, for the emergency. emergency that we had last year. Thank you. Um, right, up from plan, better than plan, correct. <clears throat> but it's still, we're, we're still at a loss for the year, but it's better than what we had planned, so. Uh, moving on to uh, the uh, general fund on page 21, uh, the overage in operating expenses does include a uh, repair to the shop door at the, um, the vehicle maintenance shop. There was uh, of $2,300 um, to repair that door so that it actually would close. Finally got done. Uh, moving on to water on page 25. Uh, <clears throat> you'll notice that there was an overage in internal allocations and uh, this is mainly due to um, the electric in water because well two was down we had to run uh, four and five and uh, well four or five uh, the kilowatt hours to run that well um, it, it's it, uh, takes more electricity to run that well than it does to run well two so electric was a little bit higher in water for the month of December um, Year-to-date total operating in water is down from plan by sixteen thousand uh, dollars, but this is mainly due to the uh, the EDU budgeting error that uh, we previously discussed. Uh, moving on to wastewater, uh, December revenues were down from plan by uh, about sixteen thousand dollars, or sixteen thousand dollars but uh, year-to-date total revenues are down from plan by $13,000. And year-to-date total operating is down from plan by $5,700 in wastewater. Uh, moving on to electric on page 28. Uh, you'll notice uh, rev... Back up for wastewater. Sure. Just one second. Just, it seems to me that wastewater and water should be generally tracking each other. So if water is just about on plan for December, how can wastewater be low on revenues? Um, well, the, the EDU error is not this. It, it, it didn't track the same in water and wastewater. Okay, so That's it's what, all the EDU right, error. Right, it's all okay. the EDU error. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Don't forget that a lot of our water sales at that point are snow making and those sorts of things that don't track into wastewater right. EDU. Right. So that's a huge chunk, right. which right. now you're going to see if you look at a month, I think you'll start seeing them come back into parity. Right. 
But definitely that, that EDU error is not tracking the same in yeah. water and wastewater right. because of commercial base rates and things like that. Right. So, uh, Again, moving on to electric on page 28. Um, December revenues are up uh, from plan by $62,000, um, mainly due to the auction proceeds. Um, Year-to-date total revenues are up from plan by $130,000. Um, uh, you'll notice that there was an overage in cost of goods sold for December. Um, this is mainly due to the fact that we had to run the, uh, the uh, powerhouse, uh, and there was $8,100 in diesel costs um, for, for running the, the powerhouse for those two days that we had the outage. Uh, Year-to-date total operating is up from plan by $182,000. And uh, again, you'll notice the other revenues um, are up from plan. Uh, ag again, this is due to the uh, FEMA funds that we received. Moving on to snow removal on page 30. Um, Year-to-date total operating is up from plan by <coughs> $52,000. And you'll notice that uh, mainly is in uh, savings and salaries and wages and benefits due to the fact that we just haven't had snow to move. So <clears throat> uh, propane on page 31. Uh, propane revenues are down from plan by $34,000. But again, you see that savings in cost of goods sold. So uh, it's actually, it, it nets out to our uh, to our benefit by about $10,000, which is why you see a total operating for um, propane right at budget. Uh, I'm just slightly under budget by $448. So, um, and that's all I have on income statements, unless there are any questions. I guess I have a general observation or question or confusion. If if uh, six months ago someone had said this is what the weather is going to be like for this season, we would have been worried about how far below budget we are. Instead, if you take the exceptional items, you know, like theme and the rest of that, we're about on budget. Um, but yet, in prior drought years, we were doing layoffs. And other, so, so what's changed? Um. I mean, Our budget. I don't. It seems to me that people. Well, I mean, you know, there's a line coming in on all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> people seem to be skiing despite. Yeah. One, one thing I can tell you, um, in discussions with Vale, Sunday of the three-day weekend in January was the largest on-mountain skier day they've had since they've owned the resort. Yeah. And because the bases of the rest of Tahoe are decimated, and there is no base in the lower elevations of those mountains, oh, so the and my son is a and my son is a ski uh, you know on ski team, yeah. having witnessed this, um, everybody's coming here because we have more than anywhere else except for Mammoth, and we're in the Tahoe region. That's why we're getting more customers. They're going to fill as you can look out the yeah. window. You're going to see they're going to start filling up middle lot in a few seconds here, and then they'll be moving down to lower lot. So, yeah. and they had a 30 minute backup on the highway on that three day weekend yeah, as I well. Yeah, I watched it. <laughs> so I, I think what you're seeing is we're not seeing the reduction in skiers that you saw in prior drought years because um, there's no really no other place to go in the Tahoe region. Don't know how Bear's doing, Terry. No. Oh, well. mm, sorry. <laughs> okay. So I, th I think that I think that's probably the benefit. And one thing I would also comment on is increased snowmaking. They ran the compressors a bit longer than they normally did. Even after the compressors, they were still using some of the guns. So increased water sales to Vail. I think mm -hmm. that has helped keep our ship righted a bit too. Yeah. Um, they've had the temperatures in terms of cold initially. Um, to do those things that they did them a little bit longer than usual. So that, I think all these things combined are what's keeping us on par. Okay. Yeah. I would agree with that 100%. Okay. Okay. Uh, moving on to December EBITDA. Um, we are uh, at $596,000 
um, EBITDA for December, um, which is uh, better than planned by $36,000. And year to date, we are at uh, $178,000 um, up from plan. So uh, good cash position. Um, we'll move on to uh, We'll move on to cash flow. I'll, I'll get to metered versus budget for January. Um, uh, the cash flow is just the cash flow from uh, last month. Um, due to the early timing of the board meeting, I wasn't able to get uh, cash flow done for January. Um, but I will be sending that out. I will be doing uh, January preliminaries and uh, a cash flow that I'll send out to the board and finance committee um, this upcoming week. So even though the board meeting was early, we'll still get those, uh, those numbers out to you. Um, so, you so you'll be able to see them. But uh, again, this is, the cash flow is just a repeat from last month. Um, so uh, metered versus budget for January. Um, I did complete billing yesterday. Um, so you'll see that uh, we metered 925,000 kilowatt hours. Our budget was for 922 kilowatt hour or 922,000 kilowatt hours, so just slightly better than budget. But again, as you said, Bob, with the fact that we haven't had that much snow, um, the fact that we're still meeting budget for kilowatt hours um, and propane as well, um, we uh, metered three million three hundred thousand kilowatt hours the budget was for 3.1 million uh, cubic feet I'm sorry not kilowatt hours 3.1 uh, million cubic feet so just uh, better than budget by 340,000 cubic feet um, you can see the the difference from last year um, just slightly under last year for kilowatt hours 48,000 kilowatt hours and um, 845,000 cubic feet less than last year but considering uh, where we were in January last year. Yeah, um, I remember it being kind of chilly. Yeah, <laughs> and, and we just had a little bit of snow in January last year, so uh, I, I, I'm glad to see that we, you know, we met budget in January this year, so. Did you say something, Eric? No, I didn't. Oh, okay, sorry. <clears throat> um, moving on to historical January kilowatt hours metered. Um, uh, a pretty average uh, January. Um, you can see through the, the drought years, 14, 15, um, we were under 900,000 uh, kilowatt hours metered. Um, obviously not as good as last year, not as good as 2013, but um, I'm not complaining about that number. Um, Cash waterfall again. We uh, we went over the fact that this is the, the same from last month, so um, uh, nothing new to report there. And uh, known budget variances. There were there were uh, no new budget variances. I did update the balance on uh, the iPad app development through January. So um, just a uh, that's the only change on the known budget variances for this year or for this uh, month. And that is all I have for finances, unless there are any questions. Thank you, Kelly. You're welcome. Do you want me to stand up here? Okay. Um, with that, any questions? We'll move on to uh, item B, which is the fiscal year 18-19 budget. Uh, so this is... Um, just an updated document that um, was produced last year. Um, we've started meeting internally. Um, the operations committee we met and talked about capital uh, quite a bit. Right. And uh, so we've started incorporating that. Um, we're, but we're just laying out the basics of how we're going to proceed in our key assumptions. Um, one thing uh, I'll note on uh, page 42 is, and this is uh, a discussion that um, we'll be having again at operations. But mosquito abatement, we have not done mosquito abatement in many years. And although we have it budgeted, one of the problems with that, we had an agreement with the state that we're, that we're covered as a abatement agency, a vector agency. 
In order to do that, we have to have someone who is certified. Um, the person, the employee who had the certification um, due to costs and the fact that we were not doing mosquito abatement, the certifications uh, lapsed. And the, they would have to retest to get that and the continuing hours and education are substantive for that and the training for that predominantly occurs in Fresno. So there's significant cost to the districts to keep someone current on those certifications. So uh, the anticipation is we will not be doing mosquito abatement again this year as we've not done for the last few years. And um, so that money we assumed a 1% decrease in the mosquito abatement. Um, and then we assumed a 1% increase in snow removal due to the new cat purchase, the new loader purchase. So that was one of the assumptions we did, did want to mm -hmm. mention um, as well. Um, uh, um, I, uh, Eric, uh, yes. is mosquito abatement, the, the, whatever those activities are, um, are they available on a contract basis? I believe they, they would be, yes. We would have to hire a consultant to do that. But, yes, we could hire that out if we desired, decided to do it. Essentially, it's walking around with sprayers, putting in certain tablets and certain um, standing pools of water. But the certifications are quite onerous for that. Um, I think that the, the state does a one-size-fits-all, and you're doing this around a playground, which is right next to an elementary school, which is right next to a church, and so you need to do all these things. Well, obviously, that's not us, but we still fall under their same requirements. But, yes, I think we could contract this out if we did have a high, or we could have our employee recertify, and we would definitely, if we did need to get to that situation, we would evaluate which is most cost-effective for our customers. I, I think it'd be good to do that evaluation because there have been seasons up here when the mosquito problem can be very bad. I will uh, probably bring that back then, Pete, for our next operations sure. committee meeting with some numbers sure. for consideration. I mean, basically, our abatement is on the larva when they're still in the larva stage, so you have to do it pretty early in the season. It's not like you can react, <laughs> you know, I mean, you have to kind of anticipate. Uh, does the county do it? Does the county do a mosquito abatement? We does do in Bear Valley. Valley. Uh, they don't do it over in Marketville area, but we do do it in Bear Valley and the same conditions with the recertification um, and different employees. We uh, contracted out with a, a place out of Tuolumne County. Okay. And, um, and then I tell them when things are getting good, you know, for them to come over. When the pools are starting to show up, I go around and look, and, and then he comes over and starts doing that. But Would you uh, be able to give me the name of that? I will. Hey, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Okay, sure. Um, other than that, there's real no there's no substantive change in assumptions uh, except for the capital budget has been revised um, pretty substantively. One of the things which we'll be talking about today, which is wastewater, so we'll get into that under a separate item, um, and uh, and then discussions about what might come out of our satisf satisfaction of our interconnection agreement with PG&E. Those are the two big variables that will occur in this budget, but all, all in all, there's really no substantive changes to the budget or the process, the anticipated uh, process on the budget. Um, so I have a question about item four, the equivalent fixture units. Um, so sometimes we call them that, and sometimes we call them equivalent dwelling units. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the... in. In this assumption that has to do with not our EDUs. It's not, oh. it's actually with a new customer. That's why I said there's a, a single, um, I, there's a new house being built, so I know that there will be another actual customer. And so that's, that's what that's referring to. It's not referring to like our base rate EDUs. That it's referring to the actual, like a new, a new dwelling. So if someone enlarges their house and adds a bathroom, that would be additional EFUs? Or? Yeah, it depends. 
it depends on how much they're increasing and what they were assessed initially. Um, what I can tell you is we go as Brandy and I are starting to we'll be going through a complete policy rules regulations standards and um, we'll be settling in on one term for everything because okay. it, essentially I hear what Kelly's saying but essentially when it comes down to the end of the day they're it's EDUs SFRs EFUs pick your poison every county every jurisdiction has a different way to do it but we we will be okay. consolidating down on one term for everything all across right. well, all I think services we've used EDUs in customer letters more than any other term that I can think of <laughs> um, but the other my other request would be is um, since I've been involved in the calculations of these for the last couple of years the calculations have that methodology has changed quite a bit based on experience and no complaints about about that but it would be we just need to better document what it is and then I think we should have an approach that says that we're never going to lower base revenue I mean, the base revenue is there to represent a target to make the budget work and the rates work. And so the EDUs is how we allocate it across the customers. But we should never do a budget where the, the total revenue drops. It's just how it gets distributed. Unless, unless I, I, I think that's what our policy should be. And so I think it could warrant figuring that out early because usually we end up programming this well into June, and then be nice to get ahead of the curve. The problem sure. with that is, though, because of having to recalculate uh, base rates for electric and propane in June of every year based on a customer's usage, mm -hmm. so there, if somebody doesn't use as much, their base rates could go down, or their multiplier on their base rate could go down based on their usage. So that's, right. that's the one variable that we right. have to take into account. But we just solved that by taking the total EDUs and dividing it into the desired revenue, and that's the dollar value of the EDU. Right. Um, last year we picked an, a value of an EDU, and then we calculated everybody's adjustments, and most adjustments went down. Mm -hmm. So that's how we guaranteed the revenue would drop. Whereas if we just said, this is the revenue we need, and these are people's relative usage, and we use that to solve what an EDU, the value of an EDU is, then revenue would be static. Or whatever we want it to be, right? Because it's still... It, so I just think it, it could warrant some early thinking. Absolutely. I think that's yeah. something we can bring back uh, perhaps to finance because, quite frankly, I've never encountered any utility that adjusts EDUs as much as the district does. Well, we're, we're, or, or, we're or what nine, an EDU means. But the, but yeah. the ordinance says we'll do it annually. Yeah. I, Based on the previous three years of usage. Based on so, the if yeah. you have that much, right. Yeah. yeah. Again, that's unusual, very unusual. Yeah, well, I would love to reduce the workload. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I would love to not have to calculate that every it's year. It's definitely okay. something we yeah. Anyway, I just think that that's one finance. of the items that could be. Uh, a little energy early on could save us some time. Absolutely. We'll okay. bring that back to finance if you think that, I think that's probably the right committee. That or planning. I'm not sure. Uh, Any predilection on that? Finance. It's more okay. like a finance. I think so. Okay. <coughs> um, I, I, I think if it's, if it's really about how to calculate EDUs, is that what it is? Or Yes. I think it's more of a, I mean, it could go to either, but um, I think it's more of a finance issue myself. Yeah, I think we all agree here. Good. Well, um, any other questions or any uh, changes that you want to see from the prior five-year forecast and methodology? Um, coming into this cold, I did a review of what was done, and I didn't see any glaring things except for the couple I've talked about and are pending. And then we'll hit the ground running with this methodology and start and be bringing a lot back more to the committees and to the board. Um, Eric, I, the only question I have, and this just has to do with um, the capital plan part. Yes. I, I mean, I look back at last year's capital plan <clears throat> for wastewater in particular, and I compared it to this. Um, can you, I, I think I'm right in saying, but maybe you can confirm that all the items that are on this list are also on last year's. It's just some of them are brought forward into the five-year 
window rather than out farther than that. Is that right? Some of that's true, and some of that is based on what we've been experiencing with the wastewater plant, which again goes to, to the, the, the next topic. Um, so yeah, some of it has rolled on, some of it has been accelerated in terms of timeline, just yeah. based on what we're experiencing. So I, I actually, as we sat down, staff sat down, we actually bumped up the timeline on a few of these, more than just rolling in one year, we actually bumped a few three or, three or four years up, right. just based on our concerns right. and, and so you're yes you're seeing some residual stuff but you're also seeing some new stuff that's definitely been bumped up the SCADA upgrade is one that I can off the top of my head moved up dramatically and the pricing moved up as well so that was that's one off the top of my head I know we moved in uh, faster um, East lift controls that was based on some issues we had out there so that was bumped up I think two years and I can go back and give you the exact specifics of what we moved up and why. I know the roof we pushed back a year um, based on an anticipated study. That was one that got it didn't go forward. It went backwards. Um, and the high, the high core is a new one. That's, um, that was not even tracked before. We weren't tracking the regular O&M rebuild on that. So that's a new one. So it's, it's a mix, Eric. I, yeah, well, anyway, I added up the wastewater, um, I think, not counting the vehicle, uh, and it was uh, one point, one, you know, on the order of one and a half million dollars. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I don't know how we'll finance it particularly, but um, maybe something for the ad hoc, the electric ad hoc committee to consider while they're considering the other financings. Yeah, we're definitely looking at some options, and I. If, well, I'll, I'll get a little bit ahead of myself for the next topic, but rolling into that, one of the keys for us to secure um, state revolving funds or uh, loans or grants or RUS funding is to actually have a project. We actually have to have a defined project, defined estimates to provide to the funding agency. And if we proceed with the wastewater preliminary design study, that's going to give us the documents and information we need such that we can proceed to the next step, which is searching for the funding. Simply because we know what we need doesn't mean we have to build it, but it gives us the step to get the funding and and right. the, make the project feasible. So I hear what you're saying, but um, I think as we roll through this next discussion, we're going to flush out whether we're going to go down that path and have something tangible to, to proceed right. with. Um, Eric, uh, relative to projects that are going to be on the north side, the highway. Mm -hmm. We have a Tesla stuff going in. We have the development plan over there. Right. <clears throat> is there is there any capital that we foresee putting out in that? So with regards, to, so Tesla is really the the best example on that one. If Tesla proceeds, and that's a question at this point now. They just put a. Again, I'm getting ahead of myself. They just put a hold on the project. They said, hold on, they're having negotiation issues with Vail, so they're not doing anything at this point. If Tesla proceeds with putting the universal charger in as part of our discussions and they're willing to incorporate that into their design, then essentially we're, we're done on that, that component of it. If we would like them to provide spare conduits across the highway since they're already going to be going across, that would be a cost to us, but... Um, that may be a, a cost we can look for the uh, NEV grants that Eric's been talking about that may be something if we can say that the upsizing or the, the spare that we'd have them put in is relative to that, that may be something to do. Otherwise, I would come out of capital. I don't, I know Tesla's very, was very hot to trot, but now they're very cold, which is what I anticipated. So I would not, I don't know that they would do anything this fiscal year anyway. Um, but if, they did move there. We, we we would possibly look for a budget augmentation if it looked like we couldn't secure grants to do that, and we needed to do it. But I don't think we're talking substantive amounts. Good, thanks. But yes, yeah, so <coughs> we will capture that. Okay. Any other questions on the budget process? Where we are. Um, with that, we'll move on to uh, item C, wastewater systems, update regarding recent collection plant and disposal issues. 
So I know we've, I've talked in various committees about this, and I've talked with you know, many of the board members just bringing you up to speed, and I know the community um, has been concerned. So I wanted just to capture in, in my short time here, this is a six-month look back, so almost, you know, I've been here, I'm, I'm in my fifth month, just trying to capture what's basically happened with wastewater um, throughout the system, both in treatment, collections, and disposal. And just trying to, to, to capture the total costs that have been incurred and, and unanticipated and, and provide the board with some of the reasons of why things have happened. And really what you'll see as we come down to a lot of this is deferred operation and maintenance. A lot of it is simply age of the system. Um, although we replaced the membranes, which is the treatment component of the treatment plant, none of the other infrastructure of the treatment plant was replaced at that time. It was strictly, and the controls relative to the membranes are essentially localized controls. It wasn't a global replacement of the wastewater treatment plant. There's minimal communication between the membranes and the existing 1980s um, SCADA system. So in terms of the treatment plant, we're starting to see stuff fail, and it seems like, I should knock on wood before I say this, but it seems like every Sunday I get a call from Rick and something else has gone wrong. And I just wanted to capture it for the board in a in, in one-stop one shopping. So what you can see is just in the last six months we've had for about $42,000 of unanticipated <coughs> expenses in the wastewater treatment plant, 73000 in disposal, and about 6000 in collection, which almost exclusively goes to the uh, backup and spill we had two weeks ago, two Sundays ago. Um, so are there any questions on this? It was more of an informational thing for the board and, as, uh, and for the customers. So if they have any questions, this is a good document to refer back to um, when they ask why we're doing things with wastewater. This really encapsulates a six-month snapshot. Um, Eric, I know you might not know, but I'm just curious to know if uh, Derek or others believe that what's happened the last six months is an acceleration of failures and problems versus other? Yes, they do. They basically, and I don't mean to put words in Derek's mouth, but Rick and Brandy are here, and we've all had many meetings with Derek about this and other staff. Essentially, this, this is about right. It's old, and it's starting to fail, and they're all starting to fail at the same time, just based on age and, uh, you know, deferred maintenance. Um, you know, one, one good example is they haven't run the um, exhaust fans um, in the plant in over 10 years yeah. and that creates issues for the equipment that's within the plant. Um, it's just they haven't been run and they broke and never got fixed and that's just one of those inherited things which leads to other problems. So you're seeing an acceleration both from deferred maintenance as well as just simply age. I think that's it's about a 50-50 I'd say between the two. Okay, thanks. Uh, the newest part of the plant was built in 1982, and the old anoxic zone was built, I think, 10 years prior to that. I took a tour of the, of the wastewater plant this week, and uh, I was kind of uh, dismayed at the, uh, the state of the roof and how bad the, the, leak is, the leaks have gotten. Uh, I mean, we've got – it's a health issue uh, in some of the offices in the lab with black mold. Uh, We've got water leaking over high voltage uh, switches and a, a safety, I think it's a real safety issue when you have high water leaking on a high voltage box. Uh, I, I don't see that we can postpone rep repairing or replacing the roof to 2021. 20, I, I just don't see that happening. I, I think it's we're gonna, something we're going to have to deal with this summer. And uh, the SCADA also is in the same condition where we have, we're going to have to do something. Either if we want to phase this in all at once or we want to do a big general plan, either way, those two, those two items I think have to be addressed this summer. Well, the two I just heard about, the fan and the roof, aren't even on this list. Well, they were on the... They're in the, they're in the capital list. Okay, they okay. I, I'm yeah. looking at the failure list. And yeah, no, <laughs> the roof failure has been ongoing for... Um, yeah, a decade. Well, but it's same. just got it's got it, it it's gotten way worse, worse than I can yeah. ever remember it. Uh, I would urge that any board member who has the time to ask uh, our staff to give them a tour of the facility. I mean, yeah. if you see it, 
Mm-hmm. One one picture's worth a thousand words. So. Yeah, and, and just to add into that real quick, um, Howard Hoffman has asked for a tour, and we were giving it to him on at 3.30 on Tuesday. So if anyone else would like to attend, I just please RSVP because I need to get uh, personal protective equipment for everybody that's going. And please wear non-skid shoes if you're coming. I will try to make that. Uh, at what time? 3.30? 3.30 on Tuesday. I will try to make that. I'll, I'll let you know for sure. Uh, but um, just, you know, sort of in support of what Peter is saying, that's why, I, yeah, I think it would be really interesting to see if, um, you know, if, if we could borrow fairly inexpensively at this point $1.5 million, you know, while we're looking into the other things, you know, then we have the cash just to go get this stuff done rather than, because I agree with Peter, I mean, it sounds like a safety hazard, a health, health hazard, I mean, more than what we want anyway. I think my only concern is throwing good money after bad, putting a band-aid on something mm-hmm. where we may ultimately replace or abandon may not be the best use to customer money, and that's my concern. Yeah, yeah, but so it really becomes a balancing act. I don't anticipate the skipping ahead. I don't anticipate the preliminary engineering studies going to be take extraordinarily long. I imagine probably a two to four month period, depending on how quickly we can get a proposal out and responses, and if we get responses back from engineering firms, and then getting a preliminary study um, to look at that, and then the board can make a. And I would hope, you know we would have something concrete to proceed forward with. But I, I hear what Peter's saying. That roof, you know, again, it's been deferred maintenance, gone on for, you know, decades, and it's finally on its last, last legs. Uh, actually, from your experience, um, I, I guess if we were to go to Russ to see if they would lend us money on, on uh, or, you know, back, a guarantee, give us a, provide the guaranteed loan, that would be through a different part of us, right? I mean, it'd be through the state office. Yeah, it's, it's a different it's a different branch than the electric branch that you've dealt with. It's the one I'm with, with one with which I'm more familiar. And um, yeah, I have some good relationships here. And, and as uh, Terry told us, there's a new state director, so um, I'll definitely want to be introducing myself to her. And uh, good. okay. And. Uh, don't get me wrong when I said that we need to address these two items pretty pretty quickly. I, that doesn't mean I don't think we should get an overall plan. I think we really need an overall plan. We we've been kind of reacting knee jerk knee jerkedly through the last 25 years to what has come up and all the different changes. And uh, it'd be really good to have a big scope of where do we go from here in terms of protecting the membranes. Uh, Preparing ourselves for a potential build out if if real estate ever takes off again, uh, I think it's really important because some of the steps that we've taken over the over the years have proved to be detrimental to our uh, controls and I mean, the John Deere putting them in the building right. created a lot of contamination. I mean, it saved us money in the short term by going off Mountain Utilities grid, but it did some damages to. The, to the controls that now have to be rectified. So I think a general overall plan we should be budgeted for, and I, and I would support that. Any other questions on the incurred costs these last six months? No. Okay. And move on to the feasibility study? Absolutely. <clears throat> um, so one of the things that came out of our capital planning was a more focused discussion on wastewater, um, quite a few meetings actually. And staff's recommendation essentially is that we retain a um, civil engineer with expertise in wastewater treatment plants to do a feasibility study on our options. The focus would of course be to utilize as much of the existing plant as possible, particularly the, the membranes which are doing very well in terms of their uh, operation. Uh, despite their age, I was, I was actually expecting to see more of a reduction in efficiency. Um, and based on Derek's last cleaning, and I was there for that and got a look at it quite a bit, um, they're not seeing a lot of fraying at the ends of the membranes and the 
the biggest and most important thing called transmembrane pressure, TMR, is actually almost as when they were new, which is pretty surprising for the age of those membranes. So they're doing great. So the intent would be to utilize as much of the existing site, plant, equipment that we can reuse. I think that really what that comes down to is just the membranes and maybe if we rehab the basins in which they reside, which have not been rehabbed since, or not nothing been done to them since 82, um, we might be able to extend their life a little bit too. So there may be some, but again, this is something that, that someone who's spends all their career in wastewater um, versus me just dabbling in it over the last 20 years would be uh, someone to come in and tell us exactly what we can do. So that would be the intent behind this. And um, we would ask that the board um, authorize us to proceed down this path to start looking at a preliminary design study. And again, I want to emphasize simply because we have the study and we know what it's going to cost to implement options or phases doesn't mean we implement them until we have the funding. So I, I want to make sure that that's absolutely clear because there has been some confusion in, um, in the public about that. And I want to make sure they understand that this is just a planning tool and its ability for us to go after grants and low interest loans. Good. Any questions on this item? No, I, I agree with what Eric said. And are, are, do you need a motion from the board to? Uh, yeah. I so move that we uh, authorize uh, Eric to uh, uh, go out and look for some for bids, pursue bids to do the feasibility study. As outlined in the proposal. Yes. <clears throat> are you second? I, I second that. Okay. All in favor? Uh, Rickard, aye. Epstein, aye. Smith, aye. Dornbrook, aye. Good. You got your marching orders, Eric. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to item E, the performance reporting and aquifer levels. Randy. Good morning. Um, so I apologize that these weren't in your packet. Uh, we did not have the, the preliminary numbers until Friday. So this is preliminary with uh, use, especially in electric, um, estimated for the last few days of the month. Um, but what we have here for electric is um, a production in January of just over 1 million kilowatt hours. Um, our metered for the month was 925,000, resulting in a 12% unidentified loss for the month, bringing us to 13% for the year. In propane, um, we had 3.2 million cubic feet delivered to us. We again saw a negative loss for the month, a negative 5%. We're at negative 4% loss for the fiscal year so far. In water, we had about 1.9 million gallons produced from our wells, and we metered 1.8 million of those gallons. Um, so we did see a turnaround from last month that we expected to see. Um, our losses for the month of January were only 2%, and we're at 13% for the year. Uh, and then lastly, wastewater, 2.7 million gallons treated at the plant, uh, 1.8 million of those um, were metered out in the valley through our water meters, uh, leaving us with a 25, or excuse me, 28 percent unidentified loss. Um, and I would like to speak to the identified portion of the loss here in wastewater. Um, we discussed in operations uh, some plant operation. Uh, that took water that had already been metered at the plant and sent that back to the main lift, essentially metering it twice. Um, we had several items uh, this month that happened at the plant um, in which that situation occurred. Um, one of them was the uh, CIP tank filling and going back to the main lift to the tune of about 100,000 gallons. And the other was some... Um, uh, high core centrifuge maintenance. So we do, uh, we do have 133,000 gallons of identified losses in wastewater for the month, um, which you will see on this full um, performance reporting sheet. 
Um, and then I do have some information on aquifer levels to share, unless there are any further questions on performance reporting. One thing I uh, mentioned to the board on wastewater that um, Joe Pellerin brought to us and, and Brandy and I and Rick went and looked at it. Um, what we discovered is on uh, our manholes that were used, I'm assuming in the past for efficiency and cheapness, storm drain manholes were used for sewer manholes. Storm drain manholes have holes in them more than sewer manholes. Um, and as a result, you're getting significantly more I and I through a manhole lid than you would through a normal um, normal sanitary sewer manhole lid. So one of the things we're doing with snow removal staff, as obviously work is not there for snow removal, um, they're going to be um, basically welding, rectifying the problem by welding plates and backfilling those holes. Welding on cast iron is going to be an interesting thing. So any suggestions you have on that, Pete? I know you have to preheat cast iron, so just I'm sure our guys would love any insight. Maybe you can come to the shop and help us. Honestly, we would really appreciate it because cast iron is an evil thing to weld to. Um, but they make special stick rod for that. Oh, do they? Yeah. You know that? Yeah. Okay. I saw that when I was looking. Okay. So. Good. So good. We already learned something that's going to help <laughs> us. But that's one thing we're we're implementing uh, repairs on that. I believe this next week we'll be working on uh, get to the ones we, that aren't under snow that we can get to. Um, if you want to see a good example of one. It's up on Merrill at the end of the cul-de-sac there, right in the center of the cul-de-sac, Merrill and whatever that Fremont Court, Fremont Court mm -hmm. in there. So I went and looked at that one. There's also one right on Kirkwood Meadows. Now, that one's not a storm drain, but it's a bolt-down sanitary sewer lid. Normally, you see those in places where you're in a creek or a river. You'll see sewer districts use those. It's just another, and we have no bolts in them, we do, and I don't know if the rings are suitable for bolts, so we may have a mismatch there, which, again, eight holes leads to additional I and I. So um, other things that we're starting to capture in I and I um, uh, just came up. And so um, for really want to pre uh, mention to the board to thank Joe if you see him for bringing that to our attention. So. Okay. That's good. Okay. Um, for aquifer levels, uh, we do monitor these monthly. And in your packet, the January 18 numbers are uh, included. Um, we also included the annual numbers for 2016 and 17 for your reference. Um, you will notice that the well 45 aquifer level is lower this January than in past. Um, that's due to well 2 being offline uh, for a significant portion of time. Um, we started to see it drop um, the first, first week or so of December. Uh, we are monitoring that, um, and we will continue to monitor that, make sure that we get the aquifer levels back up in 4 or 5. Um, and this is just included as an informational uh, item. Brandy, even though 4 and 5 are um, down a bit from previous years, it, well, too, 28 feet is pretty good level for that, isn't it? It is, yes. Normally, I'd be 24, 26, I think. Mm -hmm. it, it got a lot of rest in December, um, so we will be utilizing that well more um, to, to do the balancing. Great. And that's all I have. Okay. Thank you, Brandy. Thank you. Yeah. It's not part of performance you're talking about. I can I'm still trying to figure out what happens here. You know that the lifts... This in January this year over last year it was 25 percent more sales to lifts kilowatt hours. The backside has been open for longer this year. I'm not. But th we're talking about January. Oh, in January. Just January. Hmm. Well, the lifts were. I mean, a lot you of storms. The one we lifts. I. Yeah. 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 So it's interesting. Chair seven was the same, and chair six was a big, big change. Sure, sure. Okay, less wind, more snow. <laughs> Put that in the budget. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to item ten, general manager report. Eric. Uh, yes. Um, I think I've covered most of this already at this point, uh, but we'll go through a quick recap. Uh, we had a, another meeting uh, between Vale and KVD. 
and the district about the employee housing ordinance. Uh, at this point, based on advice from district council and what we're theoretically able to do, um, the consensus is that we proceed with approaching the respective counties um, about administering, if we go to an in lieu of process, administering that fee as the district's not legally able to without new legislation um, from the state. The three counties would administer it jointly? They're, they're coming up with a creative way, yeah, via TriTac, which is already existing infrastructure for that, okay. um, approval by TriTac, and then release of the funds from the respective county auditors. That's the theory. It's, I mean, obviously it's going to go through the full process through each of the counties, through the planning commissions, through the board of supervisors, and of course through TriTac. But the in lieu of ha it still has merit um, conceptually as long as, you know, from the district's perspective, you know, we're, we're made whole regardless of it, but the concept is a simplification of the process and uh, it, it does have merit. And uh, so they're proceeding with doing a revised draft that will be coming back to our planning committee um, for buy-in from the committee and then ultimately buy-in from the board. They want our buy-in as the district, the utility in Kirkwood before they proceed to the counties. Um, so to make sure we're on, we have no heartburn or no major ro rocks in the road relative to that. So that's proceeding nicely. I imagine we'll see that on planning hopefully in March. That's the anticipation. We'll see how quickly it gets turned around um, between uh, Nate and Andrew um, for that. So any questions on that? Um, violation deficiency update. Um, this is relative to both the uh, water and wastewater uh, notices of deficiency or violations that we received. All documents uh, that were required to be resubmitted or submitted to the state have been done. That is complete. Um, as of Wednesday? As of Wednesday, we completed that. There are some ongoing things that they want us to do um, in perpetuity, which we've already implemented, some additional sampling. And we've implemented new protocols relative to our reporting to the state. Uh, we've implemented a triple redundancy. The state has a propensity to lose things and then blame us when they can't find them. So we are sending hard copy certified return receipt, which is a policy I implemented at my prior employment, which saved me multiple times. And we're also sending it via email. And our lab is also sending their data via email. So the triple redundancy to make sure we don't receive these again, or if we do receive them, we can rebut them quickly and have no deficiency. So um, staff did a good job in pulling that all together and getting that out on the deadlines. Any questions on that? And again, these were not public health and safety issues. These were ministerial deficiencies and violations that were noted. A Tesla charging station, as I think I've already beat that to death, they've put a hold on it as Tesla negotiates with Vail. And we're in a holding pattern at this time. Any questions on that? Any other questions? Is there an update on parking master plan? Uh, there's no more update than last time. They have a four month time frame on Vail's consultant to prepare a parking master plan. And they've solicited some uh, data from us. Um, also relative to the property exchange, how that would fit into their master plan. They're incorporating that. Should that go forward, should the board uh, approve that concept? They're working on that as well. So all I know is that they've requested the data, we've provided it, and we'll see the document as a draft comes out, I imagine, because it does affect us, especially relative to snow removal. I know Rick's field has some questions on fire lane access for that particular project. Um, I think that's been the bulk of what we've dealt with in terms of their inquiries. Okay, well, with that now it's bricks up. Good morning. As uh, we announced in the last board meeting, uh, there was a scheduled clearance with PG&E PG line from Salt Springs to Tiger Creek. And um, this occurred from January 22nd to actually ended on Monday the 29th. And uh, 
Brandy, I was off that day, but I think Brandy could probably cover that for us. What exactly happened on that, that day, Brandy? Um, we had a little bit of a power quality issue at about 4.30. <laughs> Um, and uh, we here in the office just noticed our battery backups uh, going off, maybe a little flicker of the lights. Um, after calling PG&E, they said, oh yeah, we're switching back over. Um, so uh, the, the only... That's how they notified us. That is how they notified us. And they actually noted down that that served as our notification. Um, so we'll be communicating with them to um, encourage better communication practices. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the only issue that we had, um, Derek was here, checked all of the uh, equipment at the plant, everything was fine at the waste water treatment plant. We did have a, a PLC issue at the powerhouse, um, but it was resolved by um, replacing fuse. Uh, so we, we had a minor issue. All of the power in the valley remained on. We didn't see, receive any customer complaints, um, but there was uh, a bit of an issue when we switched back over, they said, when they were um, adjusting their equipment so that it could sync back to the grid. Randy, what is PLC? Uh, programmable logic control. Okay, thank you. And we ran <laughs> off of their hydro power mm -hmm. Yeah, and we saw no problems throughout the week long of it except for um, just a little bit of a glitch there at the end. That's a 25% increase on the. That's a 25% increase in the uh, power used by the chairs too. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that made us feel a little more comfortable moving forward because we, we know they're going to plan more maintenance right. in the future. So. So, I have a question. It isn't directly related to this, but in terms of the primary transportation continuing with their connection uh, to us. If that goes through and and PG&E takes the line down, I mean, they're not going to get any power from us, right? Because we can't put power back on the line. Okay. I think that's that'll be in the their IA. We'll capture that. Well, the, the good news is PG&E is actually measured by their customer downtime, and since we're not a customer, they now have a. They now have a reporting issue <laughs> on this line that they didn't have before. Mm -hmm. So it should help us. I'm sorry, it was an aside. But That's good to know. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, unless there's any more questions on that, I'll move forward. Um, in the board's packet on page 65 is a letter that Eric received from the uh, Alpine County Safer Roads for Ambador, Calaveras, and Alpine Counties. And this is a... Um, Alpine Amador County Transportation Commission, Calver Calveras Cal Council of Governments, and Alpine County Transportation Commission. Anyway, they've, they've teamed up to evaluate the roadway safety safety throughout the Tri-County region. And um, I don't know if you were up here last week, but there was a device put on the stop sign at Kirkwood Meadows Drive in 88. It ended up being a, some kind of car counting device, which was illegally put in place. You can't put a a counting device and a traffic control device. It was there for about four hours, and then they quickly took it down. So if you saw this antenna, I was hoping it was a camera so we could see what was going on at the entrance, but just a car counting device. Um, anyway, the focus of the study is to identify projects to improve safety on the rural roadways, taking into consideration the four E's, um, and this is from their website, um, and that is enforcement, engineering, education, and emergency services. And so uh, there is a l website that the counties have set up where you can actually put in your input on how you feel the roads are either safe or not safe. And that website is at www.safertricountyroads.com. And I've uh, actually been on the website, and some of the staff members have as well, to put comments in. And I've passed this website on to Alpine County uh, Sheriff's Department as well as encouraging them to solicit uh, information for the highway to my ultimate goal is to make it safer for my firefighters having to respond to emergencies there. Um, but if you uh, go to the website, you can also find out information that they're posting on the roads themselves. And so just briefly, I thought I'd share with you some of the information I saw on the website. And 
Um, for most common collision types, uh, for both Alpine and Amador, in, in Alpine County, it's 46% uh, of accidents are related to hitting an object. Maybe that's a deer, maybe it's a rock in the roadway, or but maybe it's, it's another it's vehicle. It's not a car. It's not a car. An object is a non-car. A non-car. Thing of substance. So you're more likely to hit something like that in Alpine County than you are in Amador. It's at 43%. For collision severity, um, it's 3.23% per, in Alpine County and 1.9% in Amador County. And severe injury, uh, you're more likely to get severely injured in Alpine County than you are in Amador County, 7% <laughs> versus 5%. For primary collision factors, um, I was su surprised in Amador County, it's 31% for driving on the wrong side of the road or going over the line and hitting another vehicle. Um, and for Alpine County, for unsafe speed, 32% of the accidents are, are related to that. Um, Amador wins for DUI or being under the influence at 23%. At Calaveras. Oh, well. I'm just thinking Alpine and Amador. And then improper turning, Alpine County, uh, 37%. Night collisions, um, Alpine County is the winner, 51%, and Amador, 46 So again, I just wanted to share some of that information with you, but also get the word out that this is a, a study that's going on, and I think the more input that we get in there, the safer our roads will be. And unless there's any questions, I'll move on. And this is specific to 88? This is big. So the roadway is in the county. It's Tri-County. Yeah, yeah, it has to be so bigger than 88. Counties. Yeah. Within the three counties. And the data is taken from the state. All the roadways. State All the roadways. Yeah. yeah. It's taken from the statewide integrated traffic record systems, SWITERS, and the transportation injury mapping system, TIMS. So, uh, moving on. I'm, I'm, you have to help me with my geography. So, El Dorado County is not, doesn't have. They're not participating in this study. Oh, it's not that the roads don't pass through their county. They're Correct. Not it's just that they're not part of the, the study that's been solicited for our assistance. I see. Right. Those three counties often collaborate together. And there used to be a tri county MOU where their um, dollars from Caltrans came together, but that was dissolved. But they do get together on these type of traffic studies. Okay. But for Calveros, it would be more like Highway 4, right, is in the rest of the activity? Yes. I see. Okay. And 49. 26. Yeah. Yeah, 26. Yeah, there's there's more. 12. 12, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it'll be inter interesting to see what they post on the website and how, how, how many layers they can put into it. But they have reached out to uh, the company that's doing the survey has reached out to us. We've given them some information. But the bulk of it's going to come from CHP and, and probably from the state resources there that are listed. Um, for the Rick, fire department. Rick, I have oh, a question. Yeah. In their statistics, they separate commercial versus non-commercial? Because uh, <coughs> trucks, I know, are a big factor on 88. Uh, I don't know about the other highways, but they certainly are on 88. I'm just wondering if there's a subsection or something. For I'm not sure. You know, I just, <coughs> I just cut and paste the uh, data that they had on the website, but I'm sure it's boiled down mm -hmm. to those details. Uh, we can certainly take a look at it. I, I'll take a look at it myself. And, yeah. Okay, uh, fire department. So I'm pleased to announce that uh, we put in a assistance to firefighter grant. Um, it was due yesterday at 2 p.m. and I was unable to print it off because it has a 24 hour delay before you can print the report. But it did successfully go through and they have it. So this year, as, is, as in years past, the government set aside an appropriation of $690 million toward the assistance to firefighter grant, and that covers equipment, personal protective equipment, um, uh, buildings, vehicles, and so forth. Uh, this year, I put in the grant for 10 self-contained breathing apparatuses and 45-minute cylinders with an overall cost of $75,000. 
uh, plus shipping, handling, tax. And so the total project cost is around $76,000, and we would be required to pay 4.5% of that uh, since our jurisdiction has less than 20,000 residents in it. So we'd be looking around $3,800 if we get this grant. Um, the process uh, was pretty lengthy, a lot of information in the grant proposal itself, and once I I'm able to print that off. I'll bring that through uh, probably operations committee uh, and back to the board. But I want to thank uh, Kelly McBride who helped me with the, the budgeting side of it. And uh, uh, Kim Norton also helped a little bit with the grant itself too. Um, being the first AFG grant that we put in since we purchased the fire truck engine 93, uh, some things have changed within the grant process. And so I had a good opportunity to go through and try to figure out what the grant wanted from us. Um, the narrative sections were limited to 4,000 characters only. So I reached out to other departments and chiefs to find out how they filled this grant out before and, and stole some language that uh, they were looking for to, to make us more important. But for overall needs, this is a, a medium level uh, grant that will be considered by the government. High levels are departments that have absolutely nothing or their personal protective equipment is, is over 20 years or something like that. I mean, just not serviceable or inoperable. So they'll get priority for grant funding. We're in the medium le level where there's a good chance that we could get this, but I have no idea. And we won't know until probably mid-April before we can find out whether we were, receive this grant or not. But... Um, just wanted to bring it back to the to the board and also uh, acknowledge that information that was in, that was developed through the fire master plan was actually applied to this grant as well. So that exercise or that uh, that piece of paper really helped out too. So um, that's my report for the FP. And unless there's any questions, and Rick, on those grants, I know from previous experience on. When I was managing a community, we put in grants for handicapped buses, mm -hmm. and it actually took five years before we were actually awarded a grant. And each of those five years, we were before that, or four years, we were rejected. <clears throat> so I'm wondering if in these grants, I mean, we can anticipate some of our vehicle needs as maybe getting a little bit of a lead on those a year, maybe two years in advance, because sometimes if you keep throwing it in, that will eventually uh, sometimes. I don't know if this grant process works in a similar fashion, but that was a state grant we were involved in. So it just seemed that we kept putting it in, putting it in, putting it in. We finally got it. So. Well, this is my first step. I mean, mm -hmm. I've written other uh, matching grants, the Cal Fire 5050 matching grant, and those are fairly simple, and, and we've, been, we've been awarded those grants for wildland protected equipment. This is the first time I ever did the FEMA federal grant, and it it only kicked me out three times where I had had special help and email somebody to tell me how there was a problem with their program and they had to fix it so I could move forward. But the what you're saying, the narratives, the the information that they really want to see those 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 buzzwords, I think moving forward we'll have at least a, a template for next year's grant cycle, mm -hmm. but also we'll, we'll tackle this much sooner. I didn't have as much time as I'd like to to have full staff review and really get these narratives where they should be and the budgets the way they want to see them. So, um, and I'm not exactly sure which staff member uh, will be assisting me for writing grants, and Eric and I have been discussing who the right person is, but the more you do it, the more you get it refined, the, more, yeah. the better chances you are of receiving the grant. So. Good. Good move. <clears throat> Any other questions on that? Anything else, sir? No, sir. I'm sorry. Okay, we'll move on to the uh, standing committee reports. Um, we have no planning committee to report operations. I think we covered everything okay. already. And. Um, I have a couple for the personnel committee. Uh, we met on January 23rd. We reviewed uh, uh, GN some financial training options for the general manager. 
uh, staff training accomplishments, board training. We have one scheduled for May 12th following our board meeting on, uh, that month. Team building uh, for board members and staff on May 18th. And uh, uh, appointment as needed to um, um, separate the confidential material, privileged material, so we can go into closed session. So we uh, determined that we would appoint an ad hoc committee as a need arises for that, rather than trying to incorporate those reviews in a personnel committee format. And the next meeting of the personnel committee will be March 27th. Um, also on January 23rd, I authorize the appointment of a fire services funding ad hoc committee. Uh, it will be reporting to the finance committee. It will be chaired by Eric Rickard. And we have some volunteer members, and I thank them all. John is here. John Ritter uh, will be a member. Alan Sack, Sapp, Tony Sarika from um, uh, East Meadows, and Bruce Giano. Nola, who has uh, served in these capacities in the past. So we're thankful for all the volunteers. And uh, we suspect this ad hoc uh, funding committee uh, to take about three or four months. And they will be looking primarily at uh, the funding options that are listed in the newly adopted master plan, which are Mellow Roos from special districts, all kinds of funding ideas. Because currently we're looking at, <clears throat> in the proposed budget for next year, an $87,000 increase, which would, if no, under fund, no other funding sources are found, would be um, pretty much levied on the property owners, uh, which we are hoping to avoid. We're hoping to spread out uh, the contributors to our costs here. So anyway we have that committee and that is just getting off so uh, Eric will be calling the first meeting of that very shortly and that would be all the reports I have finance committee uh, we did not meet uh, we met next uh, meet on February 22nd very good uh, uh, if I could just say Eric did set the first meeting for uh, Valentine's Day at 2 for the fire funding ad hoc. okay that's the first meeting The other thing we did on personnel is we recommended that we provide an annual summary of the use of ad hoc committees so we have a general sense of why we've used them and, and how. Since, since they aren't part of the Brown Act or, or a special, pro, you know, they are a special process. Okay, anything else on standing committees? Uh, yeah, the IT committee uh, met on January 23rd. <coughs> And the main thing we focused on is going through an inventory of every single computer operations or system that we have and making sure that we've identified who the owners are, how the security works, and to make sure that we have policies on all of them um, in preparation of fending off <clears throat> whoever wants to try to attack us. Uh, we want to be well, <clears throat> well prepared for managing that. <clears throat> the other thing that came up that we're evaluating is <clears throat> there is a state law <clears throat> regarding uh, ADA for websites. So for, vi <clears throat> excuse me, for visually impaired or um, um, things of that sort. And our web development is not in full compliance. So we're looking at various ways of gradually getting into compliance without uh, breaking, breaking the budget. And this is, did not come up from any customer complaints. It was something that uh, I guess Drew had identified. <coughs> Yeah, our insurance agency, um, Aqua JPA, regularly sends information about various webinars and things for compliance and where, where their liability lies as our insurer. And this is one they sent to us that we felt was important for us to reduce our liability on. And so we're proceeding forward with coming into compliance with 508, Section 508. That was it. Very good. Um, we'll move on to general discussion. Uh, yeah, Jeff, I've got a couple of items. Um, one is just a, a question, I guess, to, to Eric. Eric, do you know, is are, are Prop 1, State Proposition 1 monies for uh, water systems still available? I believe they're in the 
fourth phase, which is the final phase. So I believe there's still some lingering funds from Prop 1 as well as, uh, but I think you're referring to one, so water, so 1C. And then 8 as well has still has some lingering, and I forget what phase that's in. Uh, but uh, yes, I believe those are still available. Okay, I, I did notice, I mean, I saw something on a news report about Prop 1, so I just was curious about it, and I went to the Prop 1 website and, and um, saw what monies were granted to what, you know, just a general review of the kind of project, and water storage was included in, Not, some, yeah. uh, in some grants. So, uh, uh, anyway, just wanted to uh, see if there's any opportunities there. Then the other one, other one is, and this is from a news article I saw in, earlier in January, it's about the state's, actually it's C, uh, the PUCs, I guess, a fire risk map, and it's basically for the purpose of um, creating what it says here, new rules to govern how often utilities must re inspect their equipment in the field, how far tree branches must be kept from electrical lines, and how the companies prioritize safety-related repairs. And included is a preliminary draft map showing areas of little concern, um, elevated concern, and extreme risk of fire danger. And while, I mean, the map is very small, but at the juncture of the three counties, it looks like it's little concern but where our overhead line is, is both elevated or extreme, it looks like to me. So I was just wondering if you're aware of it and uh, if we're aware what kinds of rules may be coming down the pipe that we might want. I don't know that we'd be required to comply with them, but it's probably a good idea if we did. Yeah, so um, to answer your question, yes, uh, we're aware of it. One of the um, organizations to which the, the district belongs or at least subscribes to the newsletter is one of the lobbying um, well, it's a, it's a group of public utilities, and one of their act, one of their arms is lobbying, and so they've been sending updates um, on that in their newsletter about what they're pursuing um, relative to that legislation. And I, right now, I believe they're opposed unless amended. Um, I think it's the rulemaking process right now. So, the, yes, I'm tra we're tracking it, um, and, and of course, as as you know from the um, well, as you know, this this may become a moot point for us. Well, it wouldn't be a moot point for the 35, 34 KV line. Yeah, but that's not the, yeah, okay, correct. But that's not the high, I don't think that's where the high fire map was. I thought that was more towards the out valley portion. But, but I can look at it again. Um, yeah, no, it's just that the overhead line that, that comes from our substation to um, the reservoir, that overhead across line, across I bear, that goes through either elevated or extreme. Okay. Yeah, no, we'll definitely look at that for sure, yeah. and, and we are keeping track of it. And if we need to change our O and M policies or change our protocols for tree removal, we'll definitely make sure we're in compliance. But um, I'm just okay. I'm just keeping abreast of the legislative and, and rulemaking movements for now. Um, there is a legislative day. Uh, coming up for aqua and I would presume there might be a similar thing for the electric industry so that's something that the board um, could consider participating in going to visit your respective uh, uh, legislators those are yeah. usually productive days um, especially given the diversity of our board in terms of other residences as well the ability to hit more legislators might be more productive for us to do that uh, do it as a board so some, something to yeah, think about it this particular thing may may not actually be state legislation. It looks like it's um, the California Public Utilities Commission rule setting. Yeah, it's it's part of their rulemaking, but they do they are listening to the legislatures. There's something winding its way through right now. I'll, I'll forward you the information I have. I'll have to dig it out if I didn't throw it away. I, I don't, don't well no that's okay. I okay. just want to be sure that you're you and Brandy and the group are aware of it. Yeah. Like but thank you for bringing that up. It's important for the rest of the board to know. I think it's it's a good thing for us to all be aware of. Great. Drew, do we have anyone online? We do not. No questions? Uh, anything else from the audience? With that, um, meetings adjourned. Thank you. I tell you that presidential upgrade makes a big difference in our lives. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> and here I thought you were going to say.